sermon in a song. Did you know that? It sure was. It really summarizes our job as believers. To let our light shine and to do everything we can to win the lost at any cost. You know, the things of life are going to be over pretty soon and really only what's done for Christ is going to last. You know, you can't take all your wealth with you if you have any. You can leave it all behind, right? And your cars and trinkets and furniture and all jewelry and all that stuff, you can leave it all behind. But you can take with you to heaven the souls of those you led to Christ. That's good to know, isn't it? By the way, you can also take the word of God to heaven with you if you'll hide it in your heart. Right. Memorize the word of God. Open your Bible, please, to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. You know, whenever your, your heart is growing a little cold, you ought to read Matthew 27. That'll help warm up your heart. So if you have that open, would you stand to your feet with me if you can? And we'll read together verse 11 through to verse 26. <clears throat> so it's not very long, but we'll read that and then we'll have a word of prayer together. Matthew 27, 11 to 26. Let us begin. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now at that feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all said unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. May God bless his word. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, help us by faith to travel back in time and to witness once again what our Savior went through for us. Certainly not for himself. He had no sin. He did nothing amiss. And yet it was all in your perfect plan, dear Father. Help us to look upon our troubles and trials in life, perhaps in a similar fashion, that nothing takes you by surprise and that you allow things into our lives for our good, even if they're um, difficult things or even a bitter cup. Our Heavenly Father, bless us with faith and love tonight as we, we talk about uh, uh, these spiritual things. Prepare our hearts, please, for your table. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Please be seated. Say, what was it that nailed Jesus to the cross? 
Well, you could summarize it, I suppose, in one word. Sin. Sin seems to be at the root of our problem. Our problems in life, problems at home, problems at school, problems at work, even problems at church. It gets back to a matter of sin. And what's at the very heart of the word sin is the letter I. That means me. That's what we're saying is that uh, we have too much focus on me, too much focus on I. We need to get our focus and our eyes on Jesus. But sin um, is really getting rampant these days. The news seems full of it, right? It wasn't that long ago uh, in the news that a gas station attendant here in the lower mainland was um, uh, dragged to his death over $12. A guy went and put $12 of gas in and then tried to take off. The attendant tried to stop him and ended up being dragged by the car to his death all over $12. What kind of craziness is that? Not long after that happened, there was a bus driver here in the lower mainland that was beat up for 50 cents. It gets crazier, doesn't it? Um, boy, I remember when I was a boy, this fight, fist fight broke out between these two, two guys from the public school that I attended. And they had bloody noses and, you know, they were uh, really going at it. And uh, they were fighting over five cents. A few years ago, not that long ago, in San Francisco, the San Francisco police chased and shot to death a teenager over a $2 bus ticket. Apparently, he didn't have the little piece of paper that you get when you put the money in and he didn't have that little ticket. So he turned and ran and they fired and they shot, shot him to death. What a world we live in. It's all because of sin. Down in Florida in a city called Tarmac at a, a Walgreens store. If you're not familiar with Walgreens, it's just like another sort of a Walmart sort of thing. But it's a very familiar store in the States, and they sell all kinds of things and medication, drugs and stuff. But two Walgreen employees got into a fight in the lunchroom over who would get to cook their soup first. Two ladies, and one actually stabbed the other, grabbed a knife and stabbed her co-worker all over who would get to put their soup in the microwave first. What causes this? It's sin is what causes it. And uh, uh, people in the world recognize there's evil. Uh, people aren't stupid and they recognize there's evil in the world. They may not always call it sin, but they recognize it as evil. They try to do something about it. And sometimes the methods and means they choose are a little bit well, they almost would raise the hair on the back of your, your neck. In Fort Lauderdale, Florida, baggage handlers opened up a, a lady's bag and she was um, a resident, um, a citizen of the United States. She was born in Haiti and she was a, um, a citizen of the United States and she was coming back into the country and they, um, they found in her bag a human head. Um, and so they pulled her aside to to ask her, what, what's happening here? What is this? And so she said that it was all part of a voodoo ceremony to ward off evil spirits. Isn't that crazy? Wow. People's hearts and minds are darkened. And um, here's a lady who recognized evil in her life and evil in her family. And she... She was going to fix it through a, a voodoo spell involving a, a head. Now, the news article didn't say whose head that was. But uh, she was in hot water because of it. Um, a few years ago, here in our country, we had an outbreak of listeriosis. Listeriosis is a nasty disease. Ay, ay, nasty. 
and people die from listeriosis. Um, in Africa, I think it was just a year or maybe two years ago, the World Health Organization was battling listeriosis and a thousand people were infected with listeriosis. Now listeriosis is, um, uh, as I say, a, a nasty and dangerous uh, disease. It's highly contagious. It's bacterial in nature and they named it after the same guy that the mouthwash Listerine, you know, uh, his name was Lister, Dr. Joseph Lister, and they named this disease after him, and I'm not sure why, but um, it's a highly contagious uh, bacterial disease, and as I say, people get deathly sick and they die from it. And the United States has had an outbreak of it a few years ago, and we had it here in Canada. And I don't know if any of you remember that, but it was uh, tied up with uh, maple leaf foods. They traced it back to a processing plant in maple leaf foods. And they found that there was a certain part of a machine that was kind of like, a certain part was deep inside this machine that wasn't getting washed, wasn't getting sterilized. And that was the cause of the listeriosis. Uh, almost 60 people got deathly ill, and 22 people in Canada died because of listeriosis. Now, listeriosis uh, may kill dozens, but I'll tell you what, sin is killing billions. We have a problem in this world, not just in Canada, but we have a problem worldwide, and it's called sin. And it's the root cause behind why Cain killed Abel. It's the root cause behind why we had a first world war and a second world war, and it's going to happen, folks. There will be a third world war. There's wars happening all the time, all over. And war is definitely not a, a pretty thing at all. Um, this is why we need Jesus. Jesus came to deal with the sin problem. And I'll tell you something, you and I need Jesus more than he needs us. Have we realized that yet? There's a story about a man named Thomas Wheeler. And a few years ago, he was the chief executive officer of a huge insurance company in the United States. It's called the uh, Massachusetts Mutual Life Insurance Company. And he was the, the, the top dog, the, the, the chief hog at the trough, the, the CEO, the chief executive officer. He had the corner office, and he had the million dollar a year salary, and he was feared and loved and respected and held in awe by uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, people and tens of thousands of employees and so on. He tells a story where he and his wife were traveling someplace, and as they were going down the highway, they realized that their car was almost out of gas. And so he took the nearest exit, and started looking for whatever he could find, the gas station. And there was this little bit of a hick town, and there was a little gas station there with one pump. And so he pulls in, and Mr. Wheeler got, uh, got out of the car, and there was the gas station attendant, the only guy at this little gas station. And Wheeler asked him to fill up the tank with gas and check the oil. He was going to go stretch his legs. And so he goes for a bit of a walk and around the building, and a few minutes later, he comes back and he notices his wife is in this animated conversation with the gas station attendant. And they're jabbering back and forth. When he shows up, when Wheeler showed up, the conversation ended. And she said to the gas station attendant, well, it's nice to see you again. And they got in the car and they left. And of course, Wheeler is wondering, what was that? And so as they're driving away, he asks his wife, did, did you actually know that person? And she said, yes. She said, we went to high school together. She said, in fact, I dated him for a year. And Wheeler looked at her and says, well, boy, it's a good thing you met me. He said, Imagine if you had married him, you would have been the wife of a gas station attendant. And without missing a beat, 
Mrs. Wheeler said to her husband, sweetheart, if I'd married him, he would have been the CEO of the Mutual Life Insurance Company and you would have been the gas station attendant. <laughs> but you understand, we need Jesus more than he needs us. Don't ever, ever think you don't need him. Don't ever, ever think you don't need to read his Bible. Don't ever, ever think you don't need to go to his church. Don't ever, ever think you don't need fellowship from his people. Folks, we need him far more than he needs us. You know, he came for us. You know that. And he came to fix our sin problem. And we got it big. And some of us struggle with certain sins and some of us struggle with other certain sins. But every one of us, we've got weaknesses in our heart and our lives We've got flaws in our character. And these are not things we like to talk about and parade, but we know them. At the end of the day, we lay our head on the pillow and we know who we are. And we know the struggles we have. And we need Jesus. He's the sin fixer. Amen? Over in Nairobi... Well, actually, no, it was north of Nairobi in Kenya. Nairobi's the capital city. It was north of that in a little town close to Mount Kenya, big mountain there, was a, an old grandfather, and he had a little bit of a garden, and he was tending to his garden when all of a sudden a leopard jumped out of the tall grass and attacked him. And so um, he was holding a uh, machete in, in one hand. Um, they call it a panga. And he dropped it. And with the leopard's mouth open, he plunged his hand into the leopard's mouth and grabbed hold of the leopard's tongue. The leopard clamped his jaws down on the man and his Claws mauled this guy and he had scratches all over. Here's a 73-year-old man who grabbed hold of this tongue of a leopard and he pulled this thing, he wouldn't let go, and he pulled the tongue literally right out of the mouth of the leopard. And the leopard let out a shriek that could be heard. The story says the bird stopped. Neighbors in the village heard the shriek and they came running and there he was kind of clawed up and everything but there was the leopard dying and then they finished him off with a machete. Not the old man but the, <laughs> the, the leopard. And then they hailed that old man as a hero. He went back to his town. Now they don't have government paid medical and dental like what we've got in this country. When you've got to go to the hospital over there you gotta, you got to pay. And here he was a poor farmer, old grandfather. The townspeople paid his medical bills. They hailed him as a hero for what he did. Folks, that's nothing compared to what Jesus did. Just think of what Jesus did on the cross. How he defanged Satan. Right? What Jesus did on the cross... He's our Savior. He crushed the serpent's head. Ah, hallelujah. Oh, what a Savior. He died for us and he rose again the third day. We don't serve a dead hero. We serve a living Savior. Amen. And he's coming back for us one day soon. Could be this year. Wasn't last year, was it? Good thing it wasn't last year because some people got saved this year that didn't get saved last year. It was a good thing maybe he didn't come back last year. But maybe he'll come this year. We don't know. We'll see what happens. Hallelujah. What a wonderful, marvelous Savior who came because we have a sin problem and sin eats us up like a cancer. And sin, sin in us will kill us faster than any enemy can kill us. 
And we need Jesus. Oh, how we need him day by day, moment by moment. And we need him more than he needs us. We desperately need to cling to our Savior. And I hope you love the Savior tonight. I hope with all your heart and soul and mind that you love Jesus. Here in our passage, in chapter 27, as I say, if your heart ever grows cold, just start reading chapter 27 of Matthew. And our wonderful Savior. And we stop there in verse 26, but the story goes on. The soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. That was so they could make fun of him. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns and put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. So many people today mock Jesus. They take his name in vain. That's the only time they ever use the name Jesus is in derision and mockery and disdain. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. That must have hurt and driven the thorny crown into his brow. And after that they'd mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on and led him away to crucify him. And remember he'd already been scourged. Scourging. What we know about it, we read in books. None of us here have been scourged. And I'd lay odds that none of us here have ever eyewitnessed someone being scourged. The scourging was absolutely dreadful. You'd have nightmares for the rest of your life, I think, if you witnessed firsthand someone getting scourged. They do some pretty nasty things to people in different parts of the world. But scourging was, was one, of, one of the worst. It was a whip, a long leather handle, leather wrapped around wood usually. And off the end of the handle went several long strings of leather. Sometimes they used a rope, but they liked leather. And on the ends of these long pieces of leather, they would tie sharp things like pieces of glass, pieces of metal, pieces of stone, and then a trained expert would haul off and start lacerating someone who was bound in fetters and hung over a stake of some sort. They'd rip the, the clothes off them and he would begin. And he wouldn't leave one square inch of body that didn't taste this horrible, terrible scourge. The victim often died under the scourging. It was that bad. Many of them lost so much blood. Others, they'd have heart attacks. They would die under scourging. And Jesus certainly was a bloodied mess. He was soaked with his own blood. And it was after this that they mocked him. And then they led him out to crucify him. Boy, if ever your heart grows cold, get alone with your Bible and read chapter 27. Why did he do it? He did it for you, and he did it for me. He did it because we have a sin problem. And the only, only, only cure for sin was the blood of God as a sacrifice. Hallelujah, what a Savior. When people get saved, here's one way you know you're saved. When people get saved, they have a change in life. There's changes on the inside. Stories told of a, a young lady who accepted Christ as her Savior and she applied for membership in a local church. And so the deacons sat down with her to ask her a few questions. And one of the deacons said, were you a sinner before you received the Lord Jesus into your heart? And she replied, yes, sir. Well, are you still a sinner? Asked the deacon. Well, to tell you the truth, she said, sometimes I feel like I'm a greater sinner now than ever before. And the deacon looked at her and said, young lady, would you explain what you mean by that? And she said, well, the best I can explain it 
is that I used to be a sinner running after sin, pursuing sin. But now that I'm saved, I think I'm a, a sinner running away from sin, trying to get away from it. And so they received her into the fellowship of the church. <laughs> they thought that was pretty good. Is there a change in your life where you're running away from sin? For lost people, they sin, that's all they know. Sometimes they sin really, really bad, then they feel guilty about it. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about day-to-day -day living. Are you trying to get away from sin? Or are you trying to get closer to it? Jesus came and Jesus died for you and for me to help free us from sin. Now if you turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Turn to the right. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> In chapter 11, the, the church of Corinth managed to mess up the table of the Lord. They, <laughs> those Christians, they messed up just about everything. And they messed up the table of the Lord too. And so Paul wrote this to straighten them out. Verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. And by the way, that sounds exactly like what he said about the gospel in chapter 15, uh, three chapters later, four chapters later. He said that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, as betrayed by Judas, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. And then he gave us this word of explanation. He said, This do in remembrance of me. Our Catholic friends teach that the little communion wafer, they call it the host, magically transforms into the actual flesh of Jesus Christ after they, they whisper those Latin words over top of it. It transforms itself into the actual flesh of Jesus. And they hand it out to their parishioners. And they say, here, receive Jesus. Many Catholics believe that they've received Jesus because they just came from the Mass. And the priest has put this little wafer on their tongue. And they thought that's receiving Jesus. And it's not. The, the bread was given as a token of remembrance only. We're to do it in remembrance. On May the 2nd, 1981, my wife put a ring on my finger to keep me in remembrance of the vows we made and the, the girl that I, I married. It's a token of remembrance. The communion service is done in remembrance of Jesus. It doesn't get anyone to heaven. And if ever you see a doctrinal statement that says salvation is by grace through faith plus communion, you got a problem with that. Salvation is by grace through faith plus nothing, folks. It's always been that way. The thief on the cross is in heaven and he never had communion. And he was never baptized either. And there are churches that teach that it's grace plus faith plus baptism. We call that baptismal regeneration and that is not what the Bible teaches. Communion is done in obedience. It's done in respect. It's done out of love and adoration and worship for our Lord Jesus Christ. But it's done in remembrance of Jesus. We want to never forget, folks. We always want to keep it in mind. That's why in this church, we try to observe the table of the Lord once a month. 
so that we never forget. So he goes on, he says, verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as ye drink it, there it is again, in remembrance of me. That cup does not become the actual blood of Jesus Christ. When you drink someone's blood and eat their flesh, you become a cannibal. And you violate the scriptures. God nowhere tells us to be cannibals and eat each other's flesh and drink each other's blood. But it's done in remembrance. It's a picture. And it's a far better picture than Mel Gibson's Hollywood movie, by the way. This is a far, far better picture. I've never heard of anyone who's died of a heart attack at the communion table. But I've heard now of half a dozen people that have died of heart attacks in movie theaters watching Mel Gibson's movie, The, the Passion. This is, this, this is far better. But it's done in remembrance. But it's more than that. It's done by faith. And when you do this, what you're saying to Jesus is, I love you, Lord, and there's no known sin between me and you. If there's no one sin in your life, you need to confess that. If you've hurt someone, you need to make that right at your first available opportunity. After church, call them on the way home in the car. On the way home, call them or go by and visit them. Now, maybe they hurt you first and then you just hurt them back. Well, you've got no control over what they do, but you have control over what you do. Not nice to be hurt. No one likes to get hurt. But when we turn around and hurt them back, that's not right. And so we need to make that right. And so we need to ask forgiveness. If we've taken something that doesn't belong to us, hasn't, we haven't returned it. That's not right. We need to make that up. So it says here in verse 28, let a man examine himself. Now primarily that means to make sure you're saved. If you're here tonight and you're not sure, if you're here tonight and you don't know for 100% that if you died you'd go to heaven, you've got some doubt, then what you need to do is just let the trays pass by you. Don't partake. Don't partake. You say, why? Because if you partake, you can't really do it by faith. And if you're not saved... You're saying that you belong to Christ when you don't really. You belong to the devil still. And God will put a judgment on that. You see, that's why he says here in verse 27, Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So it's very important. Very important. I've said it before. This stuff will kill you. If you're not saved and you go ahead and partake, sometimes uh, parents with smaller children and the small children don't understand and they're screaming, they want to they partake, they want to partake. And the parents say, okay, go ahead, do it. Just shh, shh, shh. That's a big no-no, parents. That's a big no-no. See, if you've got a problem with little Junior there, you probably should scoop up little Junior and take him out into the uh, foyer and play with him there so he doesn't make a fuss. But if, you're, if your children are not saved, if they're not born again, if they've never turned from their sin and trusted Christ and been born again, they can't partake. They're not supposed to partake. Don't let them partake. Now, we don't police the table around here. We don't go up and down the aisles and look for your credentials and see if you're saved. That's between you and God. Between you and the Lord. All we can do is put the warning out, right? That's all we can do. If you're here tonight and you don't know for sure you're saved, let the elements pass by. But there's a second application to examining yourself. And that's going to prayer. And we'll do that in just a minute. Where every one of us will bow our head and we'll pray, Lord, is there anything in my life that's not right? Now, I don't mean to say, have you slipped up or, you know, this year, you know, have you caused problems, you know, are you struggling this year? I'm not saying that. I'm saying, have you committed a sin? Have you opened your mouth and let one fly? Have you stolen something? 
Have you hurt someone? Have you offended someone? Have you offended God? Have you let God down on promises? Broken promises. So if you've made promises to God and you break those promises, don't sit back and say, well, God will understand. No, what God understands is that you've offended him and they haven't had apologized for it. So you need to make that right. And we'll have a chance to do that. So that's a secondary application of let a man examine himself. But then it goes on to say, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Now remember this, folks. When we, as God's children, don't judge sin within ourselves. Ah, I've committed sin. Ah, oh, well, he deserved it. She deserved it. Oh, they'll never miss this at work. I stole that. But they're such a big company. They'll never miss it and we're holding sin back, and we're not judging it and making it right, then God will have to do it for us. And God's a loving parent, like any loving parent. Now, son, you've done something wrong. You need to make that right. And he says, no, I'm not going to make it right. No, son, you need to make it right. I'm not going to make it right. Well, then the parent has to get involved and help make it right. And what God will do, because he loves us so much, we're his children, what he will do is he will chasten us. That's a nice, good Bible word for a spanking. And God will do whatever it takes to humble us, break us if he has to, so that we confess to him and get right with him. That's another good reason why you shouldn't partake. If you're saved and you're living in some kind of sin, secret sin, sin is usually secret, by the way. You're living in some kind of secret sin. You're, you're not wanting to make it right. Don't partake. Just let the elements pass by. Far, far better. But I do encourage you. Let's keep in step with God. Amen? It's far better. Let's confess sin. Let's keep short accounts with sin. Sin is what nailed our blessed Savior to the cross. We can't trifle with sin. It's, it's the enemy. It's the poison. It's the listeriosis. We've got we to gotta be ruthless with sin. We've got to deal with it and put it in its place. And so let's do that now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.